Hi guys, Drew back again with Princess Craft RV and today we are going to take a look at the appliances and the operations on the RPOD 193 by Forest River. Uh, as always, we're going to start right up front here with the loading and unloading procedure. Uh, now this camper itself is going to utilize a two inch ball uh, hooked onto your receiver. So of course, once we've done that, we're going to raise our jack three inches above our ball back underneath, set ourselves underneath the coupler. Uh, lower that jack back down, seating that ball, or seating that coupler, excuse me, fully on that ball. Uh, once we are seated, we go ahead and s uh, fold that back, uh, paying special attention that we do, in fact, engage this secondary latch. Uh, that's going to keep things nice and secure for you. Uh, also, definitely recommended that you may want to go back and add a secondary pin here. Uh, what that's going to do is keep things nice and secure right up front here. Uh, keep anything from potentially rattling loose going down the road. Uh, once we are secured here with the coupler, we take our tow chains, we cross those underneath the coupler and hook those onto the receiver of the tow vehicle. Uh, skate that fine line of having enough room to make your turns left or right, but not so much room that these may make contact with the pavement. Also in that same breath, you're going to want to go ahead and take your seven way receptacle hook that up to the corresponding plug in your bumper. This is gonna give you full function to your tow vehicle's charging system, braking system, marker lights, tail lights, all that fun stuff. Now also riding right next to those uh, tow chains is a very important safety feature. This is going to be called your emergency breakaway cable. This is essentially your last line of defense if any of these other tow components were to become compromised and the vehicle started to separate. This is going to act like a ripcord to the electric brake system. Uh, essentially preventing a runaway camper scenario. So a couple things important with this. Uh, again, just like the tow chains, you want to make sure this isn't going to make contact with the pavement at any time. Also, you want a third or separate connection point on the receiver specifically for this emergency breakaway cable, whether that be a carabiner, or quick link, uh, whatever you got to go ahead and make that connection. Hopping up here to your electric tongue jack, a couple things to mention. Of course, you have a light. Uh, that gives you a point of reference if you're backing up into the unit at dark. Also going to light your way down here if you are doing, again, any coupling after dark. Uh, easy up or down momentary toggle switch here uh, corresponds with the direction of travel. And then also on the top of that jack, we have a rubber plug that we can go ahead and remove that's going to expose the manual drive of that jack. And if you encounter any power loss situation, you can, of course, use the corresponding crank handle to maneuver that up or down uh, to load and unload the camper. Directly behind that, we have a 20-pound propane cylinder, uh, same variant you're going to find on any gas grill. This will be full for you on the time of delivery. Uh, pretty standard open and close valve on the top, pretty straightforward, held in place with a tension band and a wing nut here. Uh, when we do go to service that tank, uh, very simply turn the tank off at the valve on the top, disconnect your pigtail here, uh, loosen your wing nut, lift that tank out to get serviced. Uh, when we go ahead and return it, uh, just follow the reverse order, hooking up the pigtail, turning it on at the valve, uh, tensioning it down here. Now you also have a propane cover that's going to protect that from weather and road debris, things like that. Uh, this goes on, you can see there's a little hole on the back that's going to be facing the camper itself. And we have a little wing nut and stud here uh, what you're going to do is very easily slip this over that propane tank, uh, allow that stud to pass through that container. It can be a little tricky to get aligned sometimes, but once you've done so, you just take your wing nut and you can go ahead and screw that down. Something like that. Uh, directly behind that, we have your brand new Interstate Deep Cycle Battery. Uh, biggest thing with this is going to be just good general battery maintenance. What that means for you is two or three times a year, we're going to go ahead and lift the panels on the battery. We are going to inspect uh, the water level, make sure that that water level is still full, clear marked water line, and we're going to maintain that water level with distilled water. Uh, other than that, for periods of long-term storage, very important that we do go ahead and utilize the battery disconnect switch that we have down here uh, on the frame rail. And again, what that's designed for is to isolate the battery for periods of long-term storage. You can go ahead and flip that switch in the off position and that's going to accomplish the very same thing as physically disconnecting the battery terminals. And then down below that, we have your stabilizer jack. Now we have stabilizer jacks on all four corners of the unit. 
These are for stabilization, not for leveling. So if we're leveling the unit front to back, we're gonna use the main tongue jack. Leveling the unit from left to right, we're gonna use the tires and your choice of a leveling kit. So once we are within three degrees of level, we're gonna go ahead and run these stabilizer jacks down using again the corresponding crank handle, which is a three quarter inch drive. Uh, of course, you'll insert it right there on the drive nut. Come down, make contact with the pavement, maybe a quarter turn more just to shore everything up. These jacks aren't really meant to be load bearing, so just keep that in mind. You're not gonna really wanna crank them up or down um, in either direction. Uh, large pass-through storage compartment here. Uh, other than, of course, being that, uh, you do have access to your, your antifreeze inlet, your water pump and things behind this. Uh, very simply to remove these screws, excuse me, down the uh, down on the bottom here, and uh, of course that's going to expose that water, that, that antifreeze inlet for you uh, for when you are doing a full winterization process. Uh, next up is going to be your water connections. Uh, first up is going to be your fresh water connect connection or your tank fill. Uh, we're going to stick a drinking water hose uh, directly into that orifice. We are going to fill that up until we are satisfied. Uh, once we are satisfied with the level of water, we of course cap it off and we're good to go. Now this system is non-pressurized, so what you're going to need to do is use that onboard 12 volt water pump to pressurize that system, draw that water up to the fixtures and make it usable. That switch is located on the inside. We'll make sure that we get uh, eyes on that uh, throughout this presentation. Uh, below that we have your city water connection. Now this is what you're gonna use if you're in the capacity of an RV park or you do have full-time access to running water. Uh, you're going to use the city water connection here. When we talk about the city water connection, water pressure becomes very important. Uh, most of these units are generally rated for a water pressure in between 50 and 75 PSI, so we want to make sure that we are not, uh, we're not going past that. So easiest way to do so, or really the only way to do so, is going to be with a water pressure regulator. This particular regulator is included with your purchase. When we go to hook this up to the unit, we want to hook this directly onto the water source or spigot. So we hook that directly onto the spigot, we hook our drinking water hose to that, and then lastly, we make our trailer bound connection by rotating the trailer connection there, something like that. If we take a look down here on the underside of the camper, we see a plug uh, with a cap on. Now that's how we're going to drain that freshwater holding tank. Uh, that's of course what we're seeing is the bottom of the tank here in a plug as simple as unscrewing that and letting that water gravity feed from the tank. Uh, manufacturer recommends that anytime the unit is going to be in storage for more than seven days that you do drain all the water from the unit. Uh, there is no need to drain that tank unless you have filled it up. So it doesn't, it doesn't like back feed through the city water connection or anything. So you're only going to be draining that tank if you physically put water here in the tank fill. Uh, if we take a look here at the sticker, these stickers here, you have uh, your VIN sticker, weight rating, uh, all of that stuff is going to be outlined here. So any pertinent information with this unit you're going to find here. Uh, one thing to note while we are here is going to be your tire pressure. That's going to be 65 PSI. Uh, that is also not only found here on this sticker, but it is also found on the sidewall of the tire. Uh, with all trailer tires, you run them at the max cold tire pressure. Uh, that's what the manufacturer recommends. That's going to give you the highest weight reading, whether you're completely full or completely empty. That 65 PSI in this case is going to be the perfect number. Uh, other than that, uh, these lug nuts have been torqued to 100 foot-pounds here in the shop. Every manufacturer recommends a retorque procedure the first 15, 25, 50 and 100 miles of initial travel, it's very important that we are checking those lug nuts to make sure they are maintaining that 100 foot pounds of torque. The manufacturer further recommends that at the start of each trip there on after, we do go ahead and check and make sure they are maintaining that level of torque. Also, if you have any service done to the wheels, or you know, you change a tire, you have your bearings packed, anything like that, keep in mind that you will have to go through that retorque procedure Again, so you'll start over essentially with that 15, 25, 50, and 100 mile increments. Uh, moving on down the camper here, we have your uh, water heater. Now this is a six gallon capacity water heater. Uh, this is dual source. That means it runs on 110 volt electricity as well as propane gas with 12 volt direct spark ignition. 
Uh, can also run on both if you're inclined to do so. That's going to give you the highest recharge rate. Now they do separate these switches. The switch that we have here on, behind the gas valve here, or the regulator I should say, uh, is going to be the 110 volt heating element. You'll find the propane switch inside. Uh, and again, we're gonna get eyes on that when we do go into the unit. Now the manufacturer has some very specific uh, recommendations when using this unit. Uh, again, we're going to want to drain the unit if it is gonna be in storage for more than seven days and we are going to drain this separate of the rest of the system. And it's uh, from a safety standpoint, very important that we do it correctly to prevent any scalding or anything like that from the water. Number one, give it ample time to cool down a lot longer than you may think. It is very well insulated. It's gonna hold on to that heat uh, a lot longer than you may think. So once we are fairly confident of the temperature, we are then going to, uh, we are then going to depressurize the unit. Easiest way to depressurize these units is going to be cutting the overall inflow of water to the unit or depressurizing that system. Uh, you're gonna do that by either, if you're running off of the potable water, you're going to physically turn off that 12 volt water pump if you are running on this city water connection, it's as simple as turning off the valve at the water source. So with no new water entering the camper as a whole, we're then going to go to uh, any fixture within the unit, uh, whether that's going to be the kitchen, bathroom, outside shower, any of those things, and we are going to turn the hot side of that spigot on. Uh, what we're going to see is a little bit of water come out of that spigot. What it's doing is it's depressurizing the holding tank of the water heater. And once we've went ahead and depressurized it, we are safe to drain it. What you're then going to do, once you're sure you've depressurized it, you're going to come here with an inch and a 16th socket and extension. And we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna back that anode rod drain plug out of this position here. Uh, once we've done that, we've removed it, we're going to see about five and a half, six gallons of water come from this location. And then once, of course, we cease to see water, the unit is completely drained, we can go ahead and, and replace that anode rod at that time. Now, this anode rod drain plug, however you want to reference it, is a consumable part. Uh, generally, we see our customers get a year or two in between anode rods. Uh, what it does is it acts like a magnet for hard water deposits, calcification, things like that. They deposit onto the water heater and, or excuse me, deposit onto the anode rod and eat away at that as opposed to the inside of the water heater. So it's very important that we keep that in good shape. It starts out about three quarters of an inch by 12 inch. Uh, by the time it needs to be replaced, it's gonna be about the size of a pencil and look very decrepit, so keep that in mind. Now on the flip side of that conversation, uh, when it comes time to return the unit back to service, it's very important that we do prime or pump six gallons of water into the unit before we actually start heating that water. Uh, easiest way to do that is going to be uh, again, introducing water to the camper overall, uh, again, flipping that 12 volt water pump on or turning the valve uh, at the water source on. So once we have water flowing into the unit as a whole, we're again going to go to the hot side of a spigot or a hot side of a fixture and we're gonna turn that on. What we're gonna see this time is something slightly different. Uh, we're gonna see a lot more water come out, but that flow is gonna be very airy or spitty or interrupted. What it's doing is it's displacing the air within the holding tank of the water heater and replacing it with water. Uh, it takes about five minutes to work all of that air from the system. So once that flow normalizes at the fixture, that is your indicator that you have six gallons of water in the unit. We can start heating it again, whether that be with the 110 volt heating element find, found behind the propane regulator here on the unit or that secondary switch on the inside uh, that's going to run that propane with direct spark ignition. Uh, one last thing to bring up about the water heater is going to be the importance of protecting it from mud daubers and flying insects, things like that. They are attracted to the smell of propane, so they want nothing more to make this their new home. So uh, my recommendation is going to be go ahead and use some, some store-bought aftermarket screens to protect both of the, the loot, not only the louvers here, but the grating here. That's going to keep any, uh, again, flying insects from nesting within the appliance and, and keeping it in tip-top shape. Now just, to re now, now, just to go further, that, that not only goes for the water heater here, but that does go for all of the propane appliances. Now, when accessing the door or closing the door, of course, you have a little latch here. We're just going to line everything up uh, and have it transition through that slot. Once we've done so, we pull it towards us, rotate it 90 degrees. That's going to lock that door shut. Uh, another 
compartment here. Um, now, if we do need to access that water heater for either you know maintenance or bypassing uh, the water heater for our winterization process, you can either do that right here in the compartment by removing these two screws, uh, or you can also do it from the bunk on the inside. You're of course gonna move the mattress out of the way, remove the screws that hold that cover on, or that, that piece of wood that is the, the base for the bed. And of course, that's going to give you access to the backside of the water heater. If we are doing a full winterization process, we wanna make sure that we are bypassing that water heater before we introduce antifreeze into the system. Now down below that, a couple things going on. Uh, number one is going to be your low point drains. Those are going to be the lowest point in the unit's plumbing. That's how we are going to drain everything in between water source and fixture. All the to and from plumbing is going to be drained via gravity from uh, those two lines. Now the proper procedure to empty the, the unit completely of water is going to of course be the fresh water holding tank, number one, if it's been in use, you're going to go ahead and drain that. That's that, that cap we saw on the underside of the camper. We're then gonna come here to the low point drains. We're going to go ahead and open those up, let that gravity uh, drain from that location. And then lastly, we're going to finish up with the water heater outline, using that procedure that we outlined just a few moments ago. Once you've done that, you have 99% of the water drained from the unit. Now, if you were going one step further and going to do a full winterization process, we would then access the backside of the water heater, go ahead and bypass that. Then we would go back up to the front where I initially said that that antifreeze inlet would be located. And we are going to introduce our antifreeze from that location using the water pump. Now, also down here on the underside, we have your uh, dump valves, gray for gray water. Gray water is going to be anything that comes from the sink or the shower. Black for black water, that's going to be the toilet waste, body waste, things of that nature. And then here on the inside, we have a bayonet, or in between the two, I should say, we have a bayonet style fitting where we are going to connect our sewage hose. Now, a couple things uh, to keep these valves operating correctly. Number one is we're going to keep them in the closed position. We're going to use the monitor panel on the inside and we are only going to dump when that indicates full or we are changing locations, whichever comes first. We don't wanna make a habit of carrying our wastewater with us if we do not have to. Uh, the proper procedure on dumping would be, of course, removing the cap here off of the bayonet fitting. Uh, this is, of course, going to be installed and removed the very same way your sewage hose is. So we go ahead and remove that. And you can see you have four prongs here along the outside of that bayonet fitting. And then we have two keyholes on either the cap or the sewage hose. We place those in the halfway position. And again, give that a quarter turn to go ahead and lock that on. Once we've done so with our sewage hose, we're ready to go ahead and dump. A popular option for dumping is going to be you dumping the black water first, letting that dump completely, making sure we close that valve because we do not want to have both of these valves open at the same time to avoid any cross contamination or back feeding. Once we are certain that we've gotten all of our waste water, or excuse me, our black water from the tank, we are then going to open this gray water valve. That's going to rinse any shared plumbing as well as your uh, sewage hose on the way out. Now, most people would go one step further. This unit is equipped with a black tank flush. Uh, we're gonna talk more of that uh, when we get to that, and that is on the passenger side of the unit. Uh, a little further back here, we have your cable satellite in inlet. This is just a pass-through connection to the designated TV area of the camper. This is to feed either a park cable service or an aftermarket satellite package to the unit. Uh, you know, a lot of higher-end campgrounds will offer that service as well as just about every satellite provider uh, is, again, offering a package geared towards our RVers. Either way, this is a standard RG6 cable fitting. It's just going to go ahead and pass through, again, to the designated TV area designed to feed those services to the unit. And then beside that, we have your uh, 30 amp, 110 volt connection uh, or power supply. This plugs straight into the unit. So if we go ahead and take a look, we have two slotted receptacles in one L-shaped. If we line everything up properly, it's going to plug straight in. We're going to give it an eighth inch turn to the right here. That's going to lock it in. Then we do have a secondary collar here to screw down, lock it in further. Now it is my recommendation for every single unit that we do deliver, that you're going to go ahead and add a surge protector in line. It's very important that we protect uh, the, 
the electrical appliances within the unit from uh, surges, environmental surges, substandard wiring, dirty power, all of those things uh, that we cannot see happening. It's very important that we do protect the unit from that. And of course, the only way to effectively do so is with a surge protector in line. If you have any questions on the products that we recommend or how to use them, feel free to give our parts department a call. They would be more than happy to go ahead and educate you further on exactly what we recommend and how to use them. So here to the rear of the unit, first things first, is going to be the rooftop ladder access. Uh, that brings me to an excellent point of structural maintenance. Uh, once every 90 days, it's very important that we do a 360 degree inspection top to bottom of the seals on the exterior of the unit. Now, anywhere where two pieces come together, they do use some sort of sealant to keep that water tight. On the roof, what they use is a self-leveling lap sealant, something you're going to have to source generally from an RV dealer. Uh, if we see any cracking, degradation, peeling of that sealant, we're gonna use that self-leveling to go ahead and touch up any problem areas. Here on the body of the camper, they generally are going to use a 100% silicone product. I think most of what you're going to find on this particular unit is going to be some clear sealant. So once we've, uh, again, if we see any um, you know, peeling, degradation in that, we are going to remove that bead and we are then going to lay a new bead of silicone. And it's, it's really important that we do our inspecting that again every 90 days. That way, uh, if we do again have any problem areas, we can catch that before the uh, water starts leaking into the area. And again, that's every 90 days, we're gonna make sure we're inspecting the unit. Uh, here also on the rear, we of course have your tail lights, marker lights, license plate, all that stuff. Now, these R-Pods are coming pre-wired for a Furon backup camera. Uh, feel free to use any backup camera you'd like. The wiring is there. It is essentially plug and play with the Furon system, so that's what we recommend. Uh, but it makes it super easy to go ahead and add that if you wish to do so. Uh, also, we of course have your full-size spare tire here on the rear. When we do come to have to change a tire on the unit, we're going to place our jack directly on the axle excuse me, as close to the, t as, as close to the tire as we can uh, without it interfering in our work and we're going to jack the unit up uh, from that axle point. Uh, other than that, once we have changed the tire, again, just a reminder, make sure we are going through that retorque procedure 15, 25, 50, and 100 miles uh, until we can go ahead and get that, you know, our, our spare tire, uh, until we can get that changed or, or you know, back to uh, normal. Uh, tube storage here on the bumper. Each side is going to have a removable cap. You can go ahead and store your sewage hose in there or any long storage you wish to do so. Uh, again, just a friction fit. Go ahead and give that a pull and that's going to be easily removed. Uh, moving on here, uh, first things first is going to be the awning. We're gonna go ahead and demo that on the inside. We'll show you the switch, the awning light switch. Uh, porch light speakers, all that stuff we're going to see on the inside. Uh, starting with the appliances here, we have your furnace vent here. Uh, now that's just an exhaust vent. Uh, most important thing with that is letting it exhaust. So we're not going to want to block that up, uh, keep that free flowing. Uh, second most important thing is going to be protecting that from again, flying insects, mud daubers, things like that. We're going to place a bug screen over this uh, again to keep them from crawling into the exhaust and, and making their nest. Uh, below that, we have our black tank flush. Now, again, this is going to correspond with a jet inside the black water tank, specifically designed to help blast off any compounded toilet waste, body waste, things like that. Uh, the way that you're going to want to operate this is after you've went ahead and dumped the contents of your black water holding tank. So you go ahead, excuse me, you go ahead and open up that valve. Uh, once you have drained that tank completely, we're going to make sure we hook our hose up here keep that valve in the open position. We are going to allow water to rush in here until we are satisfied with the cleanliness of the tank. Generally, once that water runs clear, you're good to go. Once you've done so, of course, disconnect from here. Go ahead and close your valve, things like that. Uh, we have a quick connect spray port here. Uh, this, all, this functions just like any other quick connect or like an air hose, something like that. It does have a locking collar here. You would slide that locking collar back that's going to allow this hose to either be installed or removed. Uh, gets a little tricky if the lines are already pressurized. So if you are having trouble making that connection, uh, just go ahead and, and turn the water pump off. That's gonna make things easier for you. Also, when you disconnect, uh, if the, the, the hose itself still has pressure and it's going to kind of spray some water out. So just keep that in mind. 
Uh, we have your fridge here. Now this is going to be uh, the rear of your fridge. From a maintenance standpoint, we would consider this not a customer serviceable unit. Uh, what that means for you is that uh, all you need to do is give it a visual inspection a couple times a year, make sure nothing's gotten in, make sure there's no uh, nothing making the, this their net making their nest in here or anything like that. Uh, also, we have your vent somewhere uh, here on the rear. And again, I just want to stress the importance of adding some secondary bug screening material here uh, to keep them uh, those flying insects from nesting within the appliance. So one of my favorite things about these new R pods is going to be the outside kitchen area. Uh, it's really cool how they've set this up and they give you a lot of working space if you are prepping here on the outside. So uh, of course you have a rail here that's going to seat both of these brackets. We're gonna talk about how we uh, kind of take everything off and stow it away when we're done. Uh, but you also have this really cool uh, cooktop griddle or griddle cooktop, however you wanna say it. Uh, now. This is going to be our propane hose. We're going to make the connection here on the backside of this unit. And uh, it's going to, again, utilize a quick connect fitting. So what we're going to do is we slide this locking collar back. We uh, kind of support this uh, gas valve from the other side. Once we've made our connection there, it's going to go ahead and lock on. And then we take the other side of our hose and we uh, feed that down here to the body and we see we have another quick connect down here behind this tire. And again, we slide that locking collar back, insert that fully, that's going to lock on. Now we have a valve here that's going to need to be opened. And once we've opened that, we, have, we come back up here. And again, this seems a bit redundant, but we have another valve back here on the back side of that. And that will allow us to go ahead and light the griddle. Now it may be easier to go ahead and remove this uh, cooktop momentarily and what we're going to do is we are going to use the igniter on the actual uh, cooktop. So what we do is we of course hold this to kind of uh, prime that or allow that flow and then we would just keep rotating this and sparking it and there you see we got the flame there. Uh, once we've done so we can go ahead and adjust the intensity of our flame. Once we are happy with it we can go ahead and just set our cooktop on top and start preparing our meal turn that off. Cool. Um, so that's basically the gist of, of how that's going to operate. Now when it comes to removing it or installing it, it's very easy to do so. We'll start with your table here. Uh, you just go ahead and lift up, has a little folding uh, ledge there, and you lift it off of that rail. And then we start with the cooktop now. You have two cotter pins that hold this, the actual uh, grill onto this bracket. We remove those. And you would remove that off of the bars. And of course, probably before you do that, uh, you certainly wanna make sure you've disconnected the propane hose there. So um, doing things a little backwards, but no harm, no foul. So once that's disconnected, we then go ahead and remove this just like we did with the shelf. We can go ahead and pull that off. Now this does fold. You have some spring brackets here. We go ahead and push those down to release the tension. We can go ahead and fold that up and we can store this stuff in the front pass-through compartment or the rear compartment. Uh, again, very easy to stow away. Uh, now with that all removed, uh, we can go ahead and see we have a couple 110 volt all-weather outlets. Those are helpful if we're uh, wanting to power any secondary devices here and not only in the uh, outside kitchen area, but um, you know, if we were enjoying the space with the awning, things like that, we could uh, plug something else in there. Uh, here at the entry door, uh, pretty straightforward. I love this nice glass door that they have. Uh, other than that, it's going to be pretty standard as to what you're going to find on a camper. Uh, you'll have your dual locks here, one for the deadbolt, which is going to be the bottom. The top one is going to be for the latch. Uh, they will utilize the same key. We also have your folding assist handle here. Now it does lock in the outward position. You can either fold that against the door if you'd like or against the body, whichever you prefer. And then our steps here are easily stowed away by folding the bottom step over the top and 
sliding right in there. Uh, that's all you have to do. You, you don't have to worry about them coming out. They will stay stowed there. And then, of course, once you want to extend them, very easy to pull out and flip down. Uh, other side here of the pass-through compartment, nothing that we haven't seen already. Uh, but uh, if we want to get a shot of that, that's pretty straightforward. Now that just about covers it here with the exterior of the 193. We're going to hop on the inside and take a look at those appliances and features. So here on the interior, first things first, we're going to talk about is going to be the Murphy bed. Uh, what you have uh, first off is going to be a jackknife sofa. Uh, whether it be this sofa or this sofa, uh, laying them out into kind of the bed position is going to operate the very same way. So what you do is I usually will put one hand on the back, one hand on the front. I lift from the front and kind of help with my other hand back and that lays down. Now one thing, important thing, very important thing to note is that when this is laid out into a bed, we cannot put that slide in. It will damage that slide if we go ahead and put it in. Uh, it is blocked. So, so definitely make sure that you are uh, kind of, this is the driving position. So when it needs to be, when you comes to end your trip, making sure you, you're putting the Murphy bed up and bringing that sofa back up is extremely important. So with that out of the way, uh, we will find a little latch here on this side, a spring latch. We lift that up, pull that out of the way that folds that down and then it is easy easy as folding our mattress back down of course we can see the master bed there uh, now of course we have the big front bay window and the side window here uh, those do utilize just some pull down shades and that's going to be a common thread throughout the camper those are uh, tensioned with the side strings if they become loose and, and do not stay up as the unit ages Super easy to go ahead and retension those. Just pull the string a little further out of the keeper, tie a secondary knot that's going to, of course, retension them. Uh, other than that, uh, we are going to fold this up, put that spring latch back in place. Now, when we're looking at the uh, sides, uh, we have dual USB chargers on both sides of the bed, and we also have dual outlets. Now this outlet is different from any of the other outlets you are going to find throughout the camper. This is your GFI protected outlet. Now they are all GFI protected and all on the same circuit. So if one of them were to get overloaded, this is going to be the reset point to restore function to all of those. So just keep that in mind. Uh, now, once we've seen all of that, we go ahead and again, you lift from the lift from the front. You may help out with the rear and kind of fold everything back in. Now, if we're talking here about the television, uh, that's going to be buckled in during transport uh, to keep that from rattling around. And if we go ahead and look up at the connections here, it is a 12 volt TV. Uh, that means you're going to have access to that off grid. Excuse me. And then if we look here at these cable connections, uh, of course, this one here is going to be the outlet uh, from the external cable connection we saw uh, to feed either a, an aftermarket satellite package or a uh, park cable service to the unit. And then this one here is going to correspond with the rooftop omnidirectional digital over the air antenna. Uh, for us to be able to go ahead and take advantage of that appliance, we need to make sure we turn that antenna booster on. So if we see that red light on, we then do a channel search through the TV. That's going to again bring any over the air uh, programming in. Now, if we were utilizing a park cable service, we're going to make sure that we turn that off. That way that uh, cable signal can bleed through the line. And then, of course, again, just a reminder, when we are uh, getting ready, ready to go down the road, we want to make sure that we do buckle our TV in uh, to avoid any damage. Uh, lights up top all throughout the unit do have a push button on the center of the lens. Now there is a master switch, I believe, for these lights, but you can really choose which ones come on and off with that switch. And then also we have a very important safety feature uh, right in between those lights. That's going to be your smoke alarm. This runs on a nine volt battery, just like any other smoke alarm. It's very important that we test all of our safety equipment before taking the unit out. Uh, that includes our smoke alarm, fire extinguisher, and our carbon monoxide LP leak detector. Now coming over here, right inside the entry door, kind of a lot going on. We have our IRV Technologies head unit. This is going to be uh, 
Bluetooth, AM, FM radio capable. Uh, you have auxiliaries in, whether that's going to be a USB or an HDMI in. And then we have two zones. One is going to be the inside speakers. Two is going to be the external speakers. We have kind of seek buttons here, play, pause, volume control here. Very kind of basic unit, very easy to uh, navigate around though. And then our on off switch there up at the top. Down below that, we have a multitude of switches. Uh, one here is going to be the awning. Now that's a momentary switch marked extend or retract. If we want to go ahead and extend that awning, uh, you of course just hold that button. Uh, if you take your finger off the button, the awning stops. These awnings are very susceptible to wind damage, so it's not something that I would really press my luck on. Uh, if it is a gusty day, make sure you are bringing that awning back in, not something you're ever going to want to leave your campsite or leave that out unattended. Uh, slide room in and out switch here. Now this utilizes the Schwintec system. Now what that means is we have two independently geared motors pushing that slide in and out. Uh, it's very important that we go full direction of travel. So if we're coming in, we're going to hold that switch until the slide is all the way in. Same on the way out. We want to avoid any short burst or partial openings. What happens is since it is two independently geared motors, if you do or if you are apt to run it in that capacity, can actually throw them out of time and then it's going to bind and it's opening it will not go in or out uh, beside that we have our awning led light strip that's going to be on the trailer side of things uh, and it's a lighted switch because if it comes gets turned on during the day uh, you want to make sure that it is on uh, or make sure you know that you know that it's on that way it's not going to drain your battery or anything like that uh, porch light switch here that's just that amber colored light we saw there on the exterior and then we have that main interior light switch here. And like I said, you can, that, that is just about function to all the lights on the uh, overhead. Uh, but you can control which ones come on and off with that switch. Uh, and it works well to do so. Uh, if we drop down here to the other side or to the underside of the cabinetry here, we have your convenience center. Uh, what this is going to do is this is going to allow you to see uh, how full your tanks are as well as your battery. Uh, this is how we're going to know when we need to dump our gray water, black water, uh, or refill our fresh water. So battery is full here. Uh, the more light you see, the fuller the particular uh, tank we're checking is. So battery is full. Uh, battery is going to read full anytime you are plugged into shore power to get an accurate readout of where your battery sits. We do need to unplug from shore power and then test from this location. Uh, we then have our fresh water, which is two thirds full. Black water, which is empty, gray water, which is just about full. Uh, and then we have our water pump switch here. Uh, that's going to pressurize the system for our testing purposes throughout this unit. We go ahead and use that water pump uh, to go ahead and draw that water up from the tank into the fixtures, pressurizing those water lines. Uh, our water heater switch here. Now, just a reminder that is for the propane uh, with the 12 volt direct spark ignition side of things. Uh, and we can use that in conjunction with the 110 volt, uh, uh, the 110 volt heating element we saw on the outside. Uh, but that is going to be the switch for that. One thing to mention with this is that uh, if you've went ahead and turned this on and you come back a couple minutes later and you see this little fault light uh, lit up, that means the water heater did not light on propane gas. Now there could be a couple of reasons as to why it did not do so. Uh, either your propane bottles off at the front of the unit or that tank is empty or just generally since the propane's at the front and the water heater's at the rear, it may not have had time to make its way to the appliance. Uh, it will cycle three times. If it does not light by the end of that third cycle, it illuminates this fault light. So uh, in the event that that happens, I encourage you just to make sure your valve's open, make sure you have uh, gas in the tank, and then come here, you flip that switch off, you flip it back on, it's going to recycle another three times. Uh, we have our fire extinguisher here. Uh, now, it's very important that we do check this every single time we take the unit out. Make sure it still has pressure. We have a little gauge there that's going to indicate pressure to us. Uh, we do just want to make sure and inspect that, that it is going to be in good shape when we need to use it. Uh, coming here into the kitchen area further, uh, not too terribly much that is going to throw you for a loop here in the kitchen area. Uh, of course, you have this countertop extender that fits over the sink. Uh, that's easily pulled out of the way. And then, of course, again, nothing too crazy, but we have our sink and spigot there. Uh, cooktop here is going to be a standard uh, kind of Coleman-style cooktop. 
Um, nothing too crazy, no sparker or igniter, so we're going to want to keep a barbecue lighter with the unit. Uh, very easily we turn it to light. Uh, we don't need to hold that in or anything. Once we turn that to light, that propane is flowing. We're going to take our lighter and uh, put the flame directly onto the burner. Once we've done so, we can go ahead and choose our intensity of the flame. Make sure that we let this cool down uh, if we've just prepped a meal before closing the lid here, um, trapping that heat there on the inside. Uh, we have a light here in a fan, just like you're going to find at home. Uh, it's very important. Uh, I didn't mention this here on the exterior of the unit, but uh, that hood vent where it transitions through the wall uh, does have an open and closed flap. So we need to open that up before prepping a meal, and we need to make sure we close it before going down the road. That's going to help keep any road debris uh, weather from making its way here into the hood vent. So just some things to keep in mind. And then down low here, we have your uh, convection microwave grill, three-way oven. Uh, this works, this is a super cool feature, but it works very, very like you're you know, used to when it comes to running a microwave. You have your modes up top, convection, grill, roast, um, and you could choose those. You would choose your preheat temperature down here. We can see those marked. Um, again, comes with a service manual, super easy, super user-friendly, uh, and it is a really, great appliance so it, it, it works really well for for prepping uh, foods that you would generally cook inside of an oven so it does well for that uh, and then down below here we have your carbon monoxide lp leak detector again another very important piece of safety equipment uh, this does not have a battery to change it's wired into the 12 volt section of the camper so you don't have to worry about that uh, it is very important that we do test it every single time we take the unit out push this test button it's going to indicate to you with a series of beeps uh, letting you know that it's okay. Now, if it does sense either one of those gases, it's going to use the light flashes here uh, that correspond with the scale outlined on the front of the unit to tell you which gas it's sensing. Uh, also here in the kitchen area, uh, down low, we have your, um, excuse me, your converter, fuse panel, breaker box here. Everything we have on the right side is going to utilize an, a replaceable automotive blade style fuse. Uh, my recommendation is picking up a couple spares of each size fuse. Uh, that way, in the event that they need to be uh, replaced, you can easily do so. And then here on the left side, we have our 110-volt uh, breakers for those appliances. Uh, in terms of function, everything is outlined there on the door. Uh, other than that, uh, pretty straightforward. Same kind of breakers you're used to seeing in the residential uh, sector. Uh, they are resettable. So pretty straightforward stuff there. And then right beside that, we have your intervac. Uh, this is again, a really, uh, really cool feature. Um, now in its base capacity, what you see here, it is still very usable. Now, if you want to kind of upgrade that road vac, uh, you can get a hold of them and get the hose attachment here. What that's going to allow you to do is of course, make your connection here and you would have, you know, a coiled hose that you could use to actually vacuum the unit. Uh, now, in its base capacity, you still have the floor pan or floor dust pan, however you want to uh, think of it. If we go ahead and lift this door up, we can see that that powers on and provides suction to this location. Now, the idea being is you would use a broom, uh, you'd sweep all that stuff into this direction, open up the door, and allow that to suck that in. Uh, now, when it comes to changing the bag with the unit, we uh, stick our finger here in this hole. That's going to actually be a release. And we can see a bag back there. Now that bag hooks on to the backside of the unit. And then we want to make sure it's hooked on here at the front as well. Uh, when it does come to replace the bag, make sure you're taking note of the code on the, or the, the uh, bag that you need. That way you can easily replace it. And then when we put that back on, we just line the tabs up here on the left side, go ahead and stick our thumb back in that hole, uh, and that's going to seat nice and tight there. We have your furnace blower motor here. Uh, now that's where all your heat from this, uh, all your heat is going to come from. Uh, it does have a 12 volt blower motor. It is going to be more than enough to keep the uh, temperature within the unit controlled. Uh, up top here, we have your Dometic refrigerator. If we go ahead and open up the freezer door, that's going to uh, expose the eyebrow panel. Now this is a two-way refrigerator, so that means it runs on 110 volt electricity as well as propane gas. Uh, very easy to navigate between uh, the sources. 
Of course, this first button is going to be the on and off button for the unit. And then the next button is how we turn that on to gas. So uh, it defaults to AC voltage if it's available or the default setting is going to be this auto. And if, it, if you have AC voltage available, it's gonna use that. Now, if, you were, if that voltage were to become interrupted uh, or you're going down the road or whatever, it's gonna automatically switch over to gas. And then if we want to run it specifically on gas, we just need to depress that switch and that is going to start lighting on gas. Uh, if it has any problems lighting on gas, it's gonna go ahead and illuminate this check light there. So very easy um, to make your way around. Uh, kind of backing up here, we have the uh, couch area here. We have your table uh, buckled in, uh, going down the road, keep that from again, uh, you know, flying loose or moving anywhere. Uh, very easy, the legs just fold up like any other card table you've ever used. Uh, this is again going to be a jackknife sofa, going to function very much like we just saw uh, with this unit over here. Uh, these armrests go ahead and get moved out of the way uh, again before doing so. Uh, some underside lighting here as well. Uh, the main reason for talking about this area is going to be your emergency exit here. If your entry door were to become blocked and there is a true emergency, you can exit the unit from this location. Uh, what you're going to do is you're going to open up both of these latches. What that's going to allow is that window to kind of swing open from the bottom, uh, kind of like a, do a doggy door allowing you to exit the unit from this location. Uh, other than that, um, you know, kind of basic stuff. We have the cabinetry here. Uh, we have, you know, sliding drawers down below, closet space here. Um, that takes us here to the bunk beds. Nothing too crazy that we need to speak of. Uh, you do have a light on each bunk as well as a set of USB chargers as well to charge any devices, things like that. Uh, again, not really too terribly much um, to talk about with that. Turn that light on so you can see that. But again, just a nice little space. Uh, just a reminder, your water heater is housed underneath this bunk here. Again, we can access that from the compartment on this side, or we can remove the mattress, remove that board, uh, and gain access to that from that location. Uh, these R-Pods now come pre-wired for solar. It's an excellent upgrade uh, and makes it easy to do so if you want to add some rooftop solar. Uh, what you would do is, of course, make your solar connections up top, cut this panel out, mount your charge controller here. The wiring is already ran throughout the unit. And then down below that, we have your air Excel thermostat. We're going to control not only the air conditioner, but the furnace from, from this location. Uh, one single mode button and then a up or down uh, temperature control. If we go ahead and hit that first, it's going to take us into fan speeds. Uh, low and high is going to be our options there for the standalone fan. If we hit it one more time, that's going to take us into cool. And we have cool high, cool low. Now with these set fan speeds, that fan's going to run indefinitely whether or not that uh, the unit itself reaches this set temperature. So to keep that kind of corresponding in the more traditional sense, we want to go ahead and make sure we put it in auto here. Uh, what that's going to do is once it reaches 74 degrees, it's going to kick that unit down completely. And then we can control that fan speed as well. We have it in the low fan speed here. If I hit that one more time, that's going to take us into the higher fan speed. And then if I hit it one more time, that's gonna take us into the furnace mode. Now that blower motor is going to come, once it kind of realizes what I'm doing, it's gonna kick that blower motor on immediately. 16 seconds after that, it actually ignites. By that 30 second mark, it's producing noticeable heat. And I would not be surprised if by that kind of minute and a half, two minute mark, it starts to set off the smoke alarm. Uh, now that is very, uh, that is just kind of the way it is in a unit of this size and totally acceptable from the manufacturer of the furnace's recommendations. Uh, reason being is, is, of course, traveling down the road, uh, the unit, you know, gets dust in it, things like that. As that dust burns off, when, again, the first 15 minutes of operations, uh, it may set off that smoke alarm. And also, it, when it first starts, uh, it's, it's not running as efficiently as it does. So as, again, it continues to run, it's going to stop setting off that smoke alarm. So just keep that in mind, uh, and it's nothing to be worried about as long, again, as it is in the first 15 minutes of operation. Uh, now coming here into the restroom, uh, nothing too, again, too, too uh, surprising or crazy, nothing that's going to throw you there for a loop. 
but uh, our toilet here uh, has a light press on the pedal that's going to fill the bowl with water and then a full press to flush. Uh, any toilet treatments are going to be uh, introduced from this location, whether that be any deodorizing product, a tissue dissolver, uh, enzymatic uh, products, any of that stuff is going to be introduced here. Just a reminder, we do want to make sure we use uh, single ply RV grade toilet paper. That way it can, um, you know, break up in the black water holding tank. And it's a very important that we feed as much water to the tank as we can. We again want to keep that in as wet or flowing condition as we can. Um, so nice long flushes are going to be uh, what's recommended with that. Uh, other than that, pretty straightforward. We have our overhead light switch here right inside the door. And again, that has a switch directly on the unit itself. Uh, you can choose whichever one you'd like. Uh, up high, we have our vent fan. Now, first off, it's very important that this fan is closed during travel. So it should be in the closed and locked position by pushing that, uh, that crank handle up. Uh, up. <laughs> and then um, when we go to use it, we wanna make sure we unlock it, obviously, and then rotate that counterclockwise to crank that up. And then we have four fan speeds here. So kind of, uh, you know, different options. Now this is an exhaust fan, uh, mainly designed to pull any moisture out when you're showering, things like that uh, from the unit itself. But again, very, very important that we do go ahead and close the unit and lock it before going down the road. And then last but not least, we have your uh, shower here. A um, couple things that are pretty straightforward is, uh, you know, you of course have your, your sink and then a diverter that's going to route that water up to the uh, shower head. And now you got this cool uh, new feature. Uh, it's escaping me what this, the actual brand name of this, but the idea of this feature being is that when you are uh, running water to the shower or specifically, um, you know, hot water, you can go ahead and turn this into the secondary position. What that's going to do is kind of create a loop in the system. Uh, that way you're not filling up those holding tanks and wasting that water. It's just going to keep re uh, you know, replenishing it back through the system. Uh, that way, if you're, you know, you have air in the system, you're waiting for hot water, things like that, you're not wasting that water. And then this will change colors on you, allow, let you know when that water is ready to go. And then once you've done so, you go ahead and you flip this down. That feeds water back to the fixture itself. And uh, it, again, it, it's just solely designed to help, uh, you know, keep uh, from wasting water, uh, specifically more or less when you're boondocking. So just about covers it here on the 2021 RPOD 193 by Forest River. Uh, we hope you enjoyed the presentation. If there's something we might have missed or you'd like us to cover forward or cover more, uh, don't hesitate to comment below or give us a call. Uh, thank you so much for your time. Really appreciate it.